Okay, so good to see you again, my brother. I love your tie. We're going to have to get a close-up of that. You've got Jefferson, Franklin, Lincoln, Grant. Yeah. It's a good tie. And the American flag and the dollar bill or two. And Jackson. The, and Jackson. And in the audience, welcome. Very, very much the conversation. A deep and good personal friend of mine and a friend of the world. He had done a number of programs with in the past. That's Kai Hayner, Ph.D., and he's the director of the Henry George School, located here in New York City. He is a scholar of a high order, is very tuned into the lessons of economic thinking and extended political organization and societal organization of uh, human society that was enunciated by Henry George. We're going to be talking about that and sh highlighting a book of his by a, uh, a Hermann von Berg, who, uh, w w which we'll get into, but hi, Kai, so good to see you. Welcome very, very much to the conversation. Thank you, Harold. Always glad to be here. I think it's worthwhile, particularly now. We're talking on the 7th of October of the year 2010, and the whole nation, the whole world has been roiled by another economic catastrophe and so forth, and we're still suffering the effects of that and that yep. sort of thing. One of the things that might be worthwhile uh, going over is Henry George and his take on economic theory and also economic practice as it applied to the the world of the roughly the end of the 19th and over into the 20th century which was a radical take that was not Marxian but was then perhaps relevant to a world that since the implosion of the Soviet Union in 1989 the Marxian analysis would held sway over those who were in opposition to the capitalist system in, in place uh, has been undercut by this book that Berg said that leaves us with some new interpretation of a model that is not Marxian in opposition to the inordinate uh, organ or the, un the inappropriate organization of world society by the economists and so forth as terms of the people writ large. That's a large thing we have. Share with the audience a little bit in a, in a, in a way Henry George and his contribution and his understanding of economics and of sociological or historical suggestions about how a society ought organize itself and along what principles and why, if you could. I'd be glad to. Mm -hmm. Henry George was a self-made man. He uh, was born in 1839, mm -hmm. died 1897, ran for mayor of New York City twice in 1886 and 1897. First time uh, he beat Theodore Roosevelt and he was beaten by the Tammany Hall uh, candidate uh, Hewitt, Abram Hewitt. And uh, some people say the ballot boxes with his name in, they were going down the Hudson. So he uh, was cheated out of the election. That's yeah, not a, that's yeah, not that, a new phenomenon. That, that's not new at no, all. No, yeah, no, the no. elections have been, that's a big issue. Yeah, but that's. And he, in 97, he died a few days before, before the election actually happened in uh, October 29th. And uh, he became actually a, a, a hero of, uh, the little guy in the street, he, 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 he sailed around the world twice as a young man. Mm -hmm. he, he skipped school at 14, uh, jumped ship in San Francisco, had more uh, adventures under his belt before he turned 20 than most of us will ever have in our entire life. Yeah. Uh, Jack London uh, describes these kind of uh, uh, fellows, uh, 19th century self-made men. Mm -hmm. uh, worked his way up, went uh, gold digging in Klondike up in the Yukon Valley. Mm -hmm. Didn't get any gold. Mm -hmm. If he had gotten any gold, we never would have heard a word from he him. He might have just lived in comfortable recluse. <laughs> he would have gone to the Bahamas and sipped martinis the rest mm -hmm. of his life. So he came back stone broke um, and worked his way up out of unemployment, became a printer. Uh, <coughs> wrote letters to the editor. The letters to the editor were so brilliant that the uh, editor-in-chief finally uh, um, kidnapped him and said, uh, you shouldn't be a printer, you should be an editor. Now, let's pause for a second then. He wrote letters to the editor. Now, um, being in a certain sense myself a student of uh, Marshall McLuhan and understanding language, you're writing editors, and you, you, uh, you, you we're going to do another progr a program with another writer today. And so writing is a in a certain sense a generic term and what i'm trying to get at is there are people who write very well yeah people who can use the language marshal the language uh, very well in a very meaningful way that could be for the new book freedom by friends and he writes well he knows how to use the language when you say a writer yeah. but then there's also the question of what is a person writing about yeah and when he ran for um, new york city and when and he also not only gained if i understand correct and i think it is 
he gained not only the uh, attention of the man in the street, whose cause he was in a certain sense championing, yes, but he right. also won the acclaim and the recognition of what was in a certain sense uh, the leading intellectual elements of world society at that time, including Leo Tolstoy, Mark Twain, and a whole lot of other people Absolutely. who were drawn to him, not because he was a great writer like Melville or something, which he was able to marshal the language, or Churchill could marshal the language, but it was in a large measure his message that he was sending in the writings, editorially or otherwise, about how the world should be organized, particularly economically, which was in opposition to the conventional wisdom of the time, is that not correct? Absolutely correct. And is that not something we want to try and get to? Absolutely. Because we need some sort of an alternative now in the year 2010 that we don't have. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. So maybe I just wanted to make that point, if you understand. Absolutely. What, mm -hmm. what, what happened is, in, in, in his 30s, he had an epiphany, and that epiphany came when he was riding out into the hills of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And he was riding with a friend, and a cowboy was coming by and he asked Henry George, young Henry George on horseback, asked that cowboy, who does the land we are riding on here belong to? Okay, and the that, land. Okay. The land. Mm -hmm. And the cowboy said, this land belongs to whatever great landowner, one owner. Mm -hmm. And George looked around and until the horizon it was all one landowner and the cows were as small as, as, small as mice at the, at the horizon. Mm -hmm. So George, it struck him like lightning. If we allow this kind of land monopolization and resources monopolization, we will never have social justice. We will never have a just society. And that was, from that, from that uh, epiphany, he went back, he studied ec classical economics. Oh, he hadn't Smith. really studied he hadn't stu he, he, he had worked as a reporter. He has, wor yeah. he has worked as an editor, right. and he had seen social injustice. Like yeah, and he was, he, was, he was very sensitive to that. That's one overlap with Karl Marx. Karl Marx uh, worked for the Neue Rheinische Zeitung. Uh, uh, Henry George worked for the San Francisco Post. So mm -hmm. they both saw uh, the wounds of the time, the social issues of the time close, close and up. And economics. Economic issues of the time, social and, and, social and economic issues, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so he went back and he started, he was an autodidact, he had left school at 14, as an I said. An autodidact. Autodidact. A very good term, self-taught, somebody running down the hair exactly. like a, uh, a fox. Exactly. Because and he, they're really motivated by their own, rather than doing what somebody else is telling them they should do in a rote way, which is too much of what education is about, Absolutely. but another side. No, 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 yeah. but that's exactly yeah. what it is. So he, he actually didn't have some weird professor he had to kiss up to. Right. He just could do his own research. Right. And he went to the libraries, and he studied uh, Ricardo, mm -hmm. Mill, Smith, and so on, mm -hmm. and he absorbed the principles of classical economics. Okay. And he took the principles of classical economics and just geared them towards a just society. Or a just society where the resources were not owned by uh, plutocratic individuals who had a vast control and of, over the means of production, maybe to use the term Marx would do, and, uh, and that he recognized, did he, I wonder, uh, not only in terms of the dialectic of argumentation going on in the 19th century, but as he cast his eye over the whole of human history, there's always been a certain class whether it's emperors in Rome, pharaohs in Egypt, kings and earls in the feudal period of Europe and so on, a small group of people who it's assumed are legitimate historically in terms of the evolving human scenario, who have all the power, all the, and the power comes from the ownership of the land yep. or the ownership of the resources that gives them an advantage in order to coerce or co-opt the serfs who were under them, uh, it, it wasn't just the 19th century, although it was getting worse in Dickensian sense with the Industrial Revolution in a sense, uh, but you understand, to make the point, it's always been like that, and so they're taking a critique not only of the 19th century, uh, you know, uh, a, a situation like Marx, but the whole of the human history in a certain sense. Did he reach out back to those loops and see it? as something that we need something really very new in terms of understanding how societies are going to be organized? Or do you understand the point oh, of the question? Absolutely. Unlike Marx, he was free market. Unlike Marx, he was against the command economy. Unlike Marx, he was against big government. He said, have a free market, 
but the free market has to be based on fair access to resources and resources allocation. Now, give me an example. To give yeah. you an example, mm -hmm. if somebody owned the air in uh -huh. this room that we are both breathing, mm -hmm. and we have to pay a nickel every time we breathe, and we're running out of nickel, we are dead. They would make a lot of money. They would make an enormous because we would be money. desperate to pay because mm -hmm. we cannot not breathe. Mm -hmm. We don't have the we don't have the option not to breathe because that's a precondition of life. Maslow's pyramid of need. It's a pre it needs. It's a precondition of life. We need air, water, food, shelter, and clothing. And that, that farmer or that cowboy who owned that great vast tract of land could have owned that as a private property right. The institution of private property, uh, the validity of it is what's been argued about by a lot of economic theorizing, even right up till now. And he was not against the idea of private property. Not Marxists tended to associate, like the, sur I want to get to it, sur the labor theory of value, the input of production is from labor, and they've argued surplus labor theory of value, and they argued against, or would do, argued against the institution of private property ownership saying all, everything should be owned by everybody in the name of, and it just happens to be that all that ownership uh, and power and wealth and power it politically would be in the hands of a government that would represent all the people, and so therefore you would have a system where you could have justice by doing away with individual greed. That was the critique of the Marxists, it seems, and then you ended up with the nomenclatura and a state capitalism like in Stalin and so forth. But again, trying to get to a large picture, and what do you think is that, uh, that analysis? The institution of private property, you said he was in favor of the free mar uh, of a market. Henry George was very strong on private property rights. He said, whatever you produce is yours, whatever I produce is mine. What neither you nor I produce nor anyone else that we have to run or administer in common, like the air, mm -hmm. because that's a precondition of life. The land? The land is, is for the classical economists, just the, the, the overarching term that takes in all natural resources. That was the basis air of the feudal system with yeah, the yeah. land ownership and so forth. And the serfs just went along with it. Now, we're, not, we're living in the United States of America, and we had a revolution in 1776 right. where we did away with primogenitor, meaning yeah. the, the right. automatic passing on of the property, landed property from father to son, and they to son. Not only private and we did away with that. That yeah, was our revolution. Well, primary gender, yeah, but we also did away with the system of dynastic order. Exactly. Where we you did have away with, uh, with divine blood. kings, the yes, divine and right we did, of kings, we did, and all We that. did away with blood aristocracy. Yeah. All of this we did away with. And, and that was a democratic country. And that was signaling a change that was coming along with not only Adam Smith in exactly. 1776, but the steam engine presaging an industrial revolution that we've been living through ever since. Yes, exactly. Okay, so that's a, th that's a point that we we would make, right? Yeah, it, yeah. It, the institution of private property, is it got a place? Does it have a place or not? Is there a market uh, critique of what we have now going in the name of market capitalism that is being advanced? Is there a critique needed now? The Soviet Union has imploded and so forth, but that we're sort of getting ahead, but I wanted to put him in the context as a major figure for an alternative view of economics that the world is grappling with now uh, that we ought to repair to. Because if we had followed his nostrums or his ideas, I wager to say we probably would not have had the Great Depression or the thing we're going through now. And we would have, in a certain sense, given 100 years of uh, under his view of things, we probably would have had a just world order that is what we're uh, hoping we might be able to arrive at, but are stumbling over outdated institutions that we have followed in the intervening period from when he introduced an idea that was important in a systems way toward the forward movement of society on the planet. What, what is absolutely exceptional about George, and you, mm -hmm. you, 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 you nailed that down correctly, what is absolutely ex exceptional about George is he understood the importance of resources in the mid-nineteenth century, 100, 120, 130 years ago, at a time when nobody was thinking about resources. They were so vast in, in this continent, yeah. Until the 1890s, we had free land you, in the United States. You could come, the, the population density was so low that whoever came from whatever country as an immigrant would always get free land. The, we the, had the, the homestead. The homestead, tax, thank yeah, you. The that, homestead. That was a very so. bump up. And, uh, that was a, a, a slight bump up that occurred and it was closed when they closed that to where the assets were, the assets or the land, let's say, 
uh, they, they were all owned by, uh, the tendency was for all the capital assets or productive assets are owned by a tiny plutocratic class. They used to be kings, now they're bankers or they're capitalists and so forth. But as, 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 long, as long as you had free land, you mm -hmm. could sidestep. Yeah, until and that's the, Turner's frontier and all that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Until, until uh, the 1890s, when that frontier was closed, it was literally true, this is the land of unlimited opportunities. Yeah. It was unlimited in the material sense. All you had to do was go out and steal it from the American Indian peoples. Which we did, which which in is a Holocaust. which is another which is another discussion about yeah. about the the genocide on the, on the uh, First Nations. That's that's but true. those genocides go back through history. Oh, but yeah, the 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 population density was not such. Yeah, right. That, that that's the, right. It wasn't enough for everybody. At it was the probably time. true when the caveman first appeared two hundred thousand years ago. We had an old Earth. All the resources were there. The no. oil, everything was there, and they were in a cave, and they had no resources, they had no knowledge, they had to learn how to make a little knife and a club and all that. So that, that metaphor probably holds throughout the whole existence of Homo sapien on the planet. The resources were essentially all there. Yeah. Okay. Now, with the, the population density mushrooming from, from when Malthus wrote about mm -hmm. his, his on overpopulation in 1897, mm -hmm. 1898, mm -hmm. Population was estimated a billion on the planet. I yeah. would say it was more like half a billion. Okay. Now, really? okay. we, yeah. we're coming close to seven billion this, this decade. You're heading for 10, I think, the UN says, if we another, don't blow it up. Another. So then what that means is uh, if, if we're heading for 10 in the next decade or two, then mm. we have 20, 20 times the population that we had when Malthus was writing. Right. Malthus right. did not think that the Earth could support, the resources of the Earth could support more than a billion people. Well, he proposed that the population increases geometric while the uh, means of uh, or the uh, resources or the cap uh, market or the production increases arithmetically. And a lot of people take some heart in that he may have been wrong because we would have been bred off the planet by now if those had held in an exponential way. But it tends to be that the more city uh, societies become industrialized and let's say get moving toward an improved material lifestyle and so forth, they cut down on the family size. And the UN figure for 10,000 assumes that it's going to level off then, by then. So that would be something that is going to self-regulate uh, that population growth. But uh, no, Malthus, no, I don't think, holds. I don't know. But well, no, go ahead. No, no the, pop the, the problem with Malthus is Malthus was wrong in thinking that the Earth could not support more people, right. more than a billion. Right. Now, Malthus put his finger on, on the right issue in the sense that he saw that population was going to be an issue. And if you take, let's say, just assume for the sake of argument, today we have 20, 20 times more people than we had in 1798. Right. If that is so, that means on the average, resources are 20 times more expensive because natural resources value is a function of population density. Low, fun low population density, low price of resources, high population density, high prices of resources. I guess that's true. My supply and demand, yeah. And, uh -huh. and, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. Henry George is the forerunner mm -hmm. of the environmentalists and the ecologists. Mm -hmm. He understood, as I said, in the mid-19th century, he mm -hmm. understood the importance of resources when it wasn't scarce yet, when mm -hmm. they were not scarce yet. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah, okay. And that yeah. means we mm -hmm. can we can safely ascertain today that all wars are wars over resources. Okay, could we make another little uh, distinction? Sure. You say resources, so we're talking about natural resources. Usually, we think land and then minerals, oil, oil, gas, box, bauxite, all the things. Air, natural resources. Any kind but of. But why do we differentiate natural resources if we take it that way from, let's just say, means of per, uh, that's part of a of a, a combination of things including um, um, including uh, institutions and buildings and this kind of thing that are not natural resources but are capital assets now as we think about it, like real estate and shopping malls and m trips to the moon and that kind of thing. Why do you want, do you want to limit it only to the natural resources like copper, raw materials, well, you or do you not tie it into the capital assets that are part of the productive process? 
the classical economists distinguish clearly between land and resources on the one side okay. and capital assets on the other side. Okay. Capital are tools, capital in the, in, the, in the language of the classical economists were tools, machinery, technology, and such. Right, that's part of the productive process, and natural resources are part of the, the mix of what is used to make products that serve humanity and so forth. That's what I'm saying. It's, natural resources are raw materials for, produ for the means of production. Well, okay, so you want to distinguish raw materials. Like I'm not distinguishing. Or, 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 the, the or classical George economists wants. did. No, well, the classical economists were in another time and all that we're talking, and so what we're trying to get at is something relevant now, and it's very important. Who's, you can own land, or you can own the empire building sitting on top of the land. They're both part of the human scenario, and they're owned in a private property way, or can be. Or they can be regulated by government. What's the difference so why between make the, the two? distinction yeah, between okay. natural resources like bauxite that has to be treated with factories and all of that, and the uh, the actual economic base of the society? The reason why we're in yeah. the environmental devastation we're in today, mm -hmm. the reason why we have the planet in in, in such a precarious state, mm -hmm. is because this distinction wasn't made anymore. The if distinction between natural resources and, and man-made resources. Exactly. Okay. Okay. That's that's important. Let's get at it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Who is who made the land? Who made the natural resources? Who made the, the raw materials? Nobody. Well, that came out of the natural order. Some people call it God and all of the things. That's that we've fine. Been, it's yeah. it comes out of nature, and uh, it's nature, not something. Yeah. It's not something that was man-made. Anything. Right. So okay. because it's not man-made, right. because. Again, air and water are preconditions for life. If right. air and water are privatized, that means if somebody monopolizes all the air and all the water on this planet, right. the, this corporation would have um, would rule over life and death of everybody on the planet. Oh, yeah, and that is something that no human being should have over another okay, human the, being. The that's that's totalitarianism. That's fascism. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's good. That's very good. You 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 get that. But then that, that makes the uh, that makes a, 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 a situation over the natural. They they had a thing at our, our founding fathers and that time we're talking about. Um, they had a thing. John Locke and some of the others out of the Scottish and or the uh, had this idea of natural law. It was very big, very big. Sue generis, individual liberty. They say in the Constitution, un uh, what is it? It's um, uh, for the the term in which un. Uh, Rights that are given by nature's yeah. law or nature or God or yes. whatever, yes. unalienable, yes. Yes. and they're not able to be violated. And so, so that was beginning to dawn in the human consciousness and the revolution being made in the United States of America, presaging the Industrial Revolution that was being made by this uh, country that probably has a model that most of the people think of in terms of the way a society should be established now called a Democrat, uh, republic. That has a uh, thing like that. So that, that, that was addressed then at that time. Now, I'm glad you mentioned the Founding Fathers because for us, the Founding Fathers are great statesmen, great politicians. Um, one reason why I have this tie on. I noticed the tie. You got to get a shot of this tie, fellas. You know, it's really something else. That's good. Have you got that trademarked or anything, or is that you know, off the market, right? W what we, what we um, when we're thinking of the Founding Fathers, we're thinking of great statesmen. Yes, and great indeed. philosophers, great mm -hmm. political philosophers, they were also all to the man great economists. Franklin, yeah. Payne, Jefferson, they wrote on economics in a very clear way, and they're all to the man going back to the physicrats. And the physicrats yeah. are the uh -huh. French economists who say the first thing that's important in considering an economy is nature and raw materials. Okay. So all the founding fathers, unlike the, the, the British Empire at the time. The British yeah. Empire, they were all mercantilists. The mercantilists Ricardo. Yeah, well, Ricardo was not a mercantilist. The, 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 oh, mercantilist. The, the, the okay, pre-classical yeah, yeah. pre, yeah. pre, pre economists. The, the trade. And, yeah, okay, tra yeah, yeah. All wealth Empire. comes from trade. Right. And th these were hired hands that would just um, increase the wealth of the ruling class, of the, of the no nobility of the royalty. Now, the nobility was done by primitive gender, as you say, and mm. by the Blood. divine right of kings, and exactly. they thought of themselves as legitimate. Exactly. So here in the United States, they were setting up a thing. How does it relate to the private property principle back again in terms of the founding fathers? And that how did it get to be where the rulers of the society, we have a, pl do we agree, you and I, that we live in a plutocracy? That the capital assets, I include within capital assets land, 
and then all the things that human beings have produced as well. That's a distinction. That's why I don't quite see why we limit it only to, public, uh, to natural resources and that it's really uh, a thing of all the combination, man and natural resources in combination, including good design and other kinds of things. But our system is not one that it t puts all the power into a plutocratic class and is run by bankers and so forth that run the world. And we haven't, what would have been different if we had gone with George, say, at the turn of the 19th century, 20th century? How would the society be different? Uh, and how would it be structured? And then, of course, you understand, I like Kelso, and we got to get to Mr. Berg, because he critiques the labor theory of value. I would like to critique the labor theory of value as holy writ in terms of economics, in terms of distributing all buying power to the citizens by their labor participation, whereas the few people own everything, like the kings, they, they own all the capital assets. The people have no ownership of anything. They only claim they have on an income in order to buy bread and be able to clear the market is they're having a job like a serf on a feudal estate and the, the templates all set by the, it just as it did in feudal times, by the people who own all the assets, including the natural resources, and they're like serfs on a feudal estate and the technology is undercutting labor's uh, input to production that they base Marx on. So those are some things I'd like to get to. And you know, I like Lewis Kelso. No. You want me to answer the yes, question? Yes, please, if you can. I'm trying to get to a picture of where the hell are we going from here now, and how did we get here? Your question, your first question was, how would this a world look under George's? Yeah, let's, that's something. Let's start with that, and then yeah, we go we on. Yeah, we got to get to Mr. Berg, and okay. a critique of the surplus labor theory of value, and a critique of the labor theory of value that sits with George. No, you want Kelso first, or you want George N first? Well, George. Okay. If if governments had implemented George, George's, uh, the George's philosophy, yeah. uh, which was partially done in 1912 by Sun Yat-sen, who was a Georgist right. in China. from 1912 to 1925, and then from 1925 to 1949, it was carried on by Chiang Kai-shek, his, okay. his, his brother-in-law. The idea is you, you, have, you hold resources, you give access to resources in taxing them. All taxes are taken from production because any tax on production, that's George's uh, revolutionary theory, mm -hmm. different from all other economists. Mm -hmm. George says whenever you tax production, you're basically committing highway robbery to the producer. And in the term producer, Henry George includes the laborer and the capitalist. Labor and capital are not in opposition to each other. They're not antagonistic. That's another big distinction between George and Marx. Labor and capital and Kelso and Kelso. Labor and capital. Okay. Labor and yeah, okay. capital are on the same side. Uh, labor and capital okay. are on the same that's side. That's a huge assumption. That's yeah. a huge. That's very yeah. different from yeah. what what we have been used to. Right. Right. Now, if labor and capital are on the same side, there's really no reason to say, if you are productive, you tax thirty percent of your productive value. That means, you have thirty percent less to reinvest. That's a loss to the private individual owner, and it's a loss to society at large. In a society that needs capital formation capability thank you, to advance thank you, technology. Thank you. Yeah, so he right. says complete, not cut of taxes, eradication of taxes, no taxes on production. In that sense, Henry George has a no tax policy. So he says, now, on the other hand, how can, we, how can we get infrastructure, how can we get social services, how can we get education, and so mm -hmm. on. Yeah things that society needs that are not provided by, by individuals. We just had the example of uh, the fireman let a house burn down because the guy had lapsed on, right. on his... Uh, right, because he lapsed on, on the $75 on a... So let the house yeah. burn down. Yeah. So, so yeah, 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 yeah. Henry George says, you just levy a user's fee on the resource that is being used. You can buy a piece of land that's fine, that's yours, and you just pay a tax to the society once a year for what that use of land. But you put buildings on it, you put a factory on it, you put whatever else you want to put on it, capital gains, mm -hmm. uh, income tax are all waived. So what would happen is a huge boost and boom of the economy would happen because of this enormous tax cut. Because would that be a tax cut that would allow for capital formation by entrepreneurs and so forth yes, more of easily course, than of course, if of what? Of course. If you don't do that, what's the, what, you're going to tax income 
as we came to well, do. Well, that's, that's the mess we're in right now. Yeah, you that's say the mess so. We're in, that's the mess we're in right now. Well, we've and been in a mess like that throughout all of human history. A few people owning everything, concentration it's not of true, wealth not, and not power. True, not true, not true, not mm. true. Uh, 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 the the ancient, um, ancient Egyptian societies, Mesoamerican societies, did not have that. Taxation of, of, of um, this kind of taxation system that we have today, plus taking land and resources as absolute private ownership was a Roman idea. Pre-Roman societies do not have that. First Nations don't have that. First Nations have the, 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 the earth is given to us by, by, by money to us, given to us by nature, and that's a gift, and we take what we need and we leave it what we don't need. How do you define the we and that we take it? I mean, the Marxists defined it as everything the comes the to the government. The tribe. Well, have we, did the, we do the, the First Nation, the tribe, the, the Iroquois, uh, the, the, the Samuels, the Mohawks, whatever yeah. was the, the unit of, of choice. Well, okay. Yeah. okay. yeah, they were nested in nature. We were nested in nature on the Serengeti Plain and that sort of thing. But then there came that. So you would tax the land, is that it? You say they have a land tax and it would be is that to raise government funds for social services in a governmental it's, it's, sex? It's or any, what, what any is kind it? of what any kind of what is covered by income tax and capital gains tax today would be covered by resources tax. What would be the difference? I mean, what, how would they? The define difference would be that we don't stimmy production. We do not stimmy production. If we we do not what stimmy. We do not stymie. 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 We yes. do not. We do not stimmy or stymie production, and that means we have a large boost of production. So At the we same time, because, uh -huh. we, excuse me, because we have natural resources users fee, we will treat natural resources carefully because they're not free. One problem was that from classical economics to neoclassical economics, it was neoclassical economics is reductionist in the sense that it reduced the three-factor economics from classical economics to two-factor economics, and they excluded nature. Nature is an externality. Well, externality, they call it, yeah. Because right. it is an externality, mm -hmm. it means it's not being calculated, it's not being figured into the, the, the equation, it's uh -huh. not being uh, 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 reckoned with, and consequently, we have the mess we have today. Okay, well, I see that in a way. Hazel Henderson talks great about that because the ecological concerns, they take everything externalities in terms of the two-factor theory. That, that's a disaster. My man, uh, uh, who I like, along with Bucky Fuller and other things, sort of in a comparison with uh, him uh, from George in the 19th century, now the turn of the 20th and 21st, is uh, Lewis Kelso, as you know, with uh, others, comprehensive thinkers and so forth. He called it two-factor. And he just said, I think what like he did. Like all other 20th like century all, economists. Well, all right. Like all other 20th century economists. And he had written earlier a book called The Capitalist Manifesto. With Mortimer and Adler. With Man the preeminent American philosopher lent his imprimatur and everything like that. But it wasn't paid attention to very much because it's very inconvenient to the power relationships of realpolitik and everything. It was but very much a, a Cold War thing. But he it, was... They had, to go, they had to go against the communists. It was like McCarthy was raging, and so they had to say they, the communists did a manifesto that was wrong, so we're doing our manifesto. Well, yeah, it was but very the much in that yeah, but Cold getting War. to behind the exactly manifesto, the even political realities that emerged, what's behind it is this idea of the labor theory of value. No, uh, L Lewis used to argue it was all one factor. Everything was one factor, and, what's the and one it was factor? labor. Everything, all the economies are set up to where you have one group of people owning everything, the means of production, whether it's natural resources or not, or also the capital instruments coming out of a mix between the two, and that that was the way, and that's the way societies are all set up. Essentially, it doesn't matter. They were arguing about that, and then along came Marx and, and argued that it, you know, had the labor input and that the all capital, all production comes from labor. You can't do anything without human labor in terms of building upon it. So then he said it's all one factor, and that's the way it is. In the United States, they, they take so much out through the taxation. A person who has a, a piece of ownership in the productive capability of the world economy, national economy, they only get about one-eighth of what they actually produce. It's taken away in income taxes, Social Security. All these things are done by government, and it's done. And then also, it's perfectly accepted that it's perfectly all right for all the assets to be owned, and that means net natural resources, as well as the productive assets created by human activity, to be owned by a tiny plutocratic class of people, and that the, peop the only way the people are going to have income is to have a job, a labor relationship to production, 
And then now that's being undercut by, you remember Keynes' letter to his grandchildren, or you Aristotle. You mentioned that. Or yeah, Aristotle. Yeah, yeah. Aristotle. There was a slave system. They've all been slave systems. The guy with the club could beat everybody into submission and everything. And so then they get that and they say, uh, it will ever need be so until the loom learns to weave. The loom is learning to weave. The technology, the extensions of consciousness in combination with the resources, we got nanotechnology coming, new materials that are a thousand times as strong as steel and one hundredth the weight. I mean, major breakthroughs that are going on. And, uh, but the only way they have to get income to the poor dears is to have a job. They'll set the template for all the, the structure of society. They'll divide it all up, and then they will provide a little, a little surf people to have a little job that they can get something back for what they do, the labor, the input, the labor. And human nature gets its sense of identity from having a job that gives them a sense of all of this. And it is the, it's the production, it's the capital assets in conjunction with the natural resources that are being utilized that are owned by a tiny class. And there's no way to have an alternative way of distributing buying power into the masses. And that's what, it's a demand side thing. And Mr. Keynes said it's going to be undercut by our technological advancement, the, uh, the, uh, the, the um, you know, the, uh, uh, he said, the, the, by massive technological unemployment. That's the only way we have to get income. To, and it's all you hear them talking about. Jobs, 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 jobs. You've got to have a role, Mr. Surf, on the estate. Don't think about owning any of the things that actually are producing the wealth increasingly in a, in a, in a, in a ratio with labor. And that's the problem. To me, the major problem is the labor theory of value. You seem not to think that, or you think it's back in taxing natural resources as opposed to all the uh, aspects of production, including you know, the means of production. That's what I'm trying to get at. Henry George would agree with Kelso. Oh, good. As to that ownership society, what is it, ESOP, employment, uh, stockholder, uh, 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 what is it? Stock? Well, the way they, they have the. They, they what's the ESA? What's Kelso's well, ESA? Uh, em employment, stock, stock ownership plans. There, there's some of that. There's some of that, but it's relatively small. And it's not accepted. It's not accepted in a major way like you would have wanted if, George if you, if to if you be let accepted. Me, if you yeah. let me explain okay. why Henry George would agree with that. Mm -hmm. In creating this ESOP, Kelso puts the worker and the capitalist in the same boat, on the same That's side, as owners. That's true, if it's working right. And that is what Henry George is doing with the concept of the producer. So they are totally in sync on that. The only problem, if I may, with the ESA, it is employee. It should be for the general society. It's not the employee. That was just the tip of the iceberg in a systems way. That, that's Ownership the should be that's distributed the to that's everybody, the that's not only the natural resources, but the whole productive process as a way of distributing income rather than depending upon labor. I don't have. I don't that's have. The I don't have an it's the labor theory of value that's the problem. I don't have an argument with that. And that's what Mr. Berg we got to. And get we're to. getting to that yeah. now. Kelso mended the ESOP with CSOP, meaning consumer. There were eight. Ownership. There were eight different ways. The, the people of the city should own consolidated Edison. The people that if have it's it the th consumer. Everybody is a consumer. That means everybody becomes. That's an right. Owner. And down the line, a everybody George, should be an owner. And George. then it's going to create a way of distributing income to the people other than jobs or employment. We don't have an argument. Okay. We do not well, have that's an a huge thing. You understand we both agree that's we, never we, brought up in we, the public that's dialogue. Fine. We, we completely agree on this. Now, okay, labor so that's part of a vision that we should be thinking about we, outside we should, of should, what's being proposed by our political candidates, including Mr. Obama and so forth. So we try to get it all brought we, okay. we, We're agreeing on this completely. Now, maybe we should, okay. Now, labor theory of value. The m clunkiest way in which that was put was by Karl Marx, who said the value of a thing is created only by the labor that goes into it. He ended up calling it surplus value. Of and that is, um, in this, exclusive, exclusivism is just wrong. Because if you don't have, if you don't do market research, if you don't create a product that fulfills a need, then nobody's going to buy it. Then that doesn't help what labor went into that. So yeah. to just say the labor that goes into a product is the only thing that uh, uh, creates, creates economic wealth, yeah. value. That creates and economic value. And everything else is externality. That's yeah. nonsense. Yeah. So what Henry George did, he bridged the classic That's right. labor theory of value with supply and demand with the neoclassical right. in saying right. it's not the labor that goes into a product, mm. but the labor that is being saved, the labor that you are willing to give up mm. 
for getting this product. Okay, that's a, that's a way of doing it. We've been doing it. But what and, and, and that's a stroke of genius of Henry George. To my mind, okay. there's no other economist who has done that. Okay, and now we're coming. Good. Now we're yeah, coming. Yeah, now we got to get. Now one last thing is supply and Please. demand. How are the people? The how are the people going to have money? to buy what can be produced in a Niagara proportions with technological augmentation. We have, just one last little thing in terms of the time in which we live. We have not only weapons that are species lethal for the first time in 200,000 years, verified, modeled. We On the other side, we have transcended at the level of capability in design, material scarcity is an ontologic reality, a biggie. That's never as, addressed. As Fuller, okay, that's, as Fuller's. And so the yeah. that's Fuller and some other thinker. You need to have a way for buying power to be put in the hands of the people that is not related to their work, not related to their input, their ownership. And then you're going to end up, you know what you're going to end up with? You talk about autodidact. You're going to end up with people who are leisured, comfortably leisured, and maybe even better than comfortably leisured. And then you're going to need institutions that are not predicated upon the idea of a market value to every human, inst every human activity. They're going to be leisured to leave the life of the mind and the spirit. And Aristotle said, when they get to the point where the loom learns to weave, they can deal with the goods of civilization when they're material goods. A major species important level of transformation is taking place now. And we may, the odds are, I think we may, instead of doing that, instead of setting up a just order of liberated rather than enslaved people, we're probably going to blow it up with the weapons that we've developed technologically and go uh, with entropy not, we in the universe. And we, put be, the, we better not. Well, no, but it's not to be laughed off. I'm not laughing it off. Okay. George's syllogism, all human beings have a right to live. Nobody can live without natural resources, so all human beings have the right to access natural resources. That's beautiful in the abstract. That's beautiful. It's not abstract, oh, it's it not, you, it's not abstract that you need to breathe. It's no, not abstract that's that not. I that's need to breathe. That's a good metaphor. That's it's, true. it's not abstract that we need water. It's, and it's not, not abstract, abstract that we need food. That is, and it's not abstract. All 99.9% .9 of the species that have ever existed have gone extinct in this universe, as far as we know. We get to a point where we've transcended materials. The, the, the we dinos, have to be the thinking. Dinos have, the dinos and have. all of the... No, 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever existed since 13.8 billion years ago when the really? organic evolutionary process but finally that's a long got time. into... But that's a long time. That's right. But they've all gone extinct. And there's nothing... That we cannot say that we now have this capability. We didn't have it in the Second World War. We were impotent out of 200,000 years as we were through all that time. Mm -hmm. But at a large level, thinking comprehensively, we now have modeling, and it works. Daniel Ellsberg brings it out beautifully, and everybody else. We set off the weapons now like we've been doing. It's not, we don't have fire bombing Dresden, we don't have fire bombing Tokyo, Vietnam with napalm. Emma, if we Emma, keep doing that, and doing that against an enemy that we're, we're doing, and it's in the works now, Isla Islamophobia, all this, if they do, it could be set off by any country. It's the end of the Homo sapiens species. It's time for a big change, like punctuated equilibrium Hell, when have a new a, appears. Hell, we don't have an argument. Okay, uh, Emma, good. That's Emma, argument arguing for warmongers? No. No. Let's go to this guy because yeah, we're running out of time. Yeah, let's go to Berg because he's important, and let's do that because we got about a few minutes now. He was a major figure, and you've written the forward to this very good book, which I've read very carefully, and it seems to me he is uh, criticizing. Uh, the Stalinist view of communism Absolutely. that held in East Germany or West. Fill us in on this major figure. He's still living, but he's writing in a you, monumental you way. Let me hold this up at a camera. They'll bring it in. You just talk to him. We've got a DVD we want to show. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you just talk. Uh, hi. So what, hi. What, what, what happened here is there's a, a man who's, who sits, uh, who presides over the think tank behind the East German dictators. Okay. He's the head of the think tank behind the East German dictators. Mm -hmm. And he is a historian and economist, and his specialty is sources of Marxism, sources of communism, 19th century, right. worker philosophies. Right. And, and that's the core of much of the left. Yeah, that's okay. the core of much of the left. And mm -hmm. what happened, unfortunately, what happened is that it's called Demythologizing Marx, the book that shattered communism in Eastern Europe, Hermann von Berg. You can uh, order it, lulu.com. You can go on Google uh, Demythologizing Marx or the, the name of the author, you get it. Yeah, and it you've written a forward yes, to this book, yes, a very mostly. well put together book. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Now, um, Berk, when he did his research at, at Humboldt University in yeah. East Berlin, uh -huh. he realized, and he was a convinced Marxist, he was a kid, he was indoctrinated, so like everybody else, he thought Marx is the great savior. Yeah, and he's 50% of the world did. Almost, they? Yeah. almost. Yeah. So, 
he he's looking at the sources and he says, hey, wait a minute. There's nothing original in Marx. The Communist Manifesto is a, plagi is a plagiarized tract. Other people have said that better. In the French Revolution, there were people, Blanqui and so on, who said yeah. much better than Marx what's happening. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. He looked at uh, La Salle, Born, Weitling, all the great uh, labor leaders mm -hmm. prior to Marx, mm -hmm. and they all said better what Marx was trying to say. So, he, so Berg found out the guy's a plagiarizer and a copyist. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. what happened tragically, much of the progressive thought, much of just society ideas mm -hmm. were monopolized mm -hmm. by the Marxists, by the Leninists, by the Stalinists, and for 150 years you couldn't do any kind of progressive thinking without either being demonized by the Marxists or becoming a Marxist Absolutely yourself. true. And that's, absolutely that's a disaster. True. Yeah, and absolutely true. And, and, yeah. In this sense, and that should be rooted out. Oh, completely. Yeah. And in this sense, uh, people like Rosa Luxemburg, uh, people like La Salle, people like uh, um, Robert Owen, Many, many uh, uh, undogmatic thinkers who had like a larger view, non-dogmatic view, no big government view, no commanding economy view, Henry George, Friedrich List, Franz Oppenheimer, a whole bunch of people. Friedrich List? Friedrich List yeah, is, okay. is, is, is a, a 19th century um, German economist who yeah. was big on, uh, well, he's, he's come down to us as a, a pr 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 promoter of protectionism, but he was big on... Uh, resources allocation. Okay, 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 okay. There were that. Yeah, but the point being, and a lot of really good people, a God good God heart, God no, signed God God signed really good people who are really concerned with improving the least among us. One mark of the progressive agenda were the leftist Marxists. Beautiful people. They were beautiful people, really concerned with something other than making a whole bunch of money, like the like the capitalists were doing, and they had a critique of it that seemed to make sense. They called it scientific socialism, and they believed it, and they were good people. And they are. People that are there tend to be people that are concerned with the uh, real social justice in a very real way. And much of the progressive contingent still hold with that. And that's something, if I'm not mistaken, still holds even though the Soviet Union imploded and all that. Now, you can call them liberal Marxists, but now what Barak is actually saying is, uh, I don't know if you want to run well, the We've got the we DVD. We've got about 12 minutes, so let's just a little setup to the DVD, and then let's underscore the fact that he's, he was a Marxist, and then he saw the error of his ways, or what? And yes. And he de de demythologized. Uh, demythologized. And the Marxist critique should not be repaired to so much by the people who are good. Th they should be thinking about new ways of seeing things that are not based on Marx, and I would submit the labor theory of value. That's even beyond Marx. That's beyond the whole way this society Marx is, is very big on the labor theory I know he He's was. one of the main proponents. And it still is intrinsic to the whole way in which the world is set up. Just think about it. That's the only way people think about getting money is through their labor participation. No. Demand and supply. You're not going to have the ability. They're going to be undercut. They're not going to be able to clear the market because they think they have to have a job or they're contributing. They get identity and a better uh, living wage or a minimum wage or something. And that's a problem that should be addressed by people who are seriously concerned about the plight of the human society with the inappropriate economic uh, understanding of the world order at this particular moment. I, I wrote a paper once, I think I mentioned it on your show, where Marx and Smith agree they're both wrong. And mm -hmm. that would, would address all these issues. Mm -hmm. In leaving out nature, in leaving out natural resources, in leaving out proper natural resources allocation. Mm -hmm. play, play, yeah, play, I know. Play rolling, play rolling. No, play. He's, they're rolling the. Yeah, they're rolling the cassette Please. now. Okay, Please. let's see if we can see it. Let's roll this piece with um, with um, Berg, and uh, we're seeing ourselves still. On, oh, here we go. Guilt and Berg, and we're going to have a little bit. You're going to comment over it. Okay. So this is a this is the Cold War thriller. The man who is who is behind the dictators realizes the system doesn't work. Mm -hmm. He gets real numbers from the Kremlin under Andropov, who was like mm -hmm. a forerunner of this uh, Hermann von Berg. Mm -hmm. He's a forerunner of uh, Gorbachev, of the whole thawing period, Glasnost, Perestroika of right. Gorbachev. There is Andropov, who is the mentor of Gorbachev, who wanted to open up the system, who wanted to open up a close totalitarian yeah. system and make it fruitful. Mm -hmm. So Berg was given from the Kremlin the real numbers. Mm -hmm. He was given the real numbers of what the economy is actually producing and he ran the numbers with friends and he came up with, in the 80s, in mm -hmm. the early 80s, yeah. he came up with 
by January 1990, the system at the latest will collapse. It did, way ahead of everybody else. Way ahead of everybody else. Mm -hmm. The system collapsed in November 1989. So the man was wrong by a month and a half over wow. all these years. That's amazing. Projected 10 years ahead. That's it. I mean, yeah. they're, they're saying in that, uh, yeah. they're saying he was called the prophet of East Germany because yeah, right. he just, okay. no, he was not, he was we not. We can't show the fine print. Yeah. He was not lying. Mm -hmm. he, uh -huh. he, like everybody else, he was not rigging the figures. They were mm -hmm. not dressing up their, 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 their they were not cooking their books. Mm -hmm. So for this honesty, mm -hmm. he was being persecuted. He was being... Well, also criticizing the, uh, the, re he, the re raison building, d'etre of the East German he, state. He, he is building his house. He's mm -hmm. building his house with his own hands. What mm -hmm. happened was after he uh, criticized Marx, they ousted him. They uh, uh, harassed his family. They took his house away. They expropriated his house. They expropriated the family. Mm -hmm. And he actually, in this book, is explaining that Marx goes back before the Enlightenment mm -hmm. into some sort of inquisitional medieval ages stage of ideology. Uh -huh. Yeah, it and got to be very uh, Stalinistic. Oh, yeah. my God. Mm -hmm. And it was exemplified in his life that the man is still alive. It's just uh, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, he is. He's, uh, he's about my age. You yes. Know? And, and he's living in Germany. And, and, and outside Berlin. And to uh, this day, he's fighting for for his house in, 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 in now supposedly a democratic West German system. Mm -hmm. Well, you had people who would have opposed Marx, uh, but they would have done it by saying they were great, uh, the, the capitalists. He was a critique. So they were here just we, saying, we all he's doing is being a running dog to the capitalists. They, he, that's what the Marxists exactly. would say. Exactly. And, and here, here you have, a, here you have a, one of the... Is that Howard Zinn? No, or? that's one of, the, the, one, of, one of the journalists who wrote on him and oh, from, from West I Germany. Can't see it from and, the and the other guy is, is a guy who uh, represents the, the nomenclatura, the old nomenclatura, who wanted to make sure that a man who there to criticize the holy Marx mm -hmm. that he will not, uh, uh, that he will just not uh, uh, get a leg on deck anymore, that he will not have a happy moment for the rest of his yeah, life. Yeah, because that was the basic uh, premise by which they organized the opposition to capitalism. And, and you had 50% 50, 50 of the world reading uh, Karl Marx. So he, and he, it was basis there. And then they did that. They were trying to rectify it and everything. But there were people. Another one is Ravi Batra, who was calling for a Great Depression and so forth. He was one of the wars. He did it by about 15 years, projected it. But it's interesting to me, the CIA, the intelligence agencies, all the, co the, the major places where you divided everything up into tunnel vision views of things, tunnel vision. Uh, they so did not predict it. They were surprised by the implosion let of the let Soviet me, let me squeeze in, Let me squeeze in a word of how he became famous. He became famous in 1978 <coughs> in smuggling out, there he is, in smuggling mm. out a, uh, one of the Spiegel reporters, a friend of his smuggled out <coughs> an article that he wrote mm -hmm. in which he declares opposition, uh, organized opposition within the Stalinist German system, uh -huh. uh, an organized opposition against the one-party dictatorship. Right, right. And that was like a death sentence. And uh -huh. that he survived this is mm -hmm. incredible. So that, that was published as Berg's Manifesto, the Spiegel Manifesto in 1978, the first two, yeah. the first two issues of what the Spiegel. What year were you? Gen January 1978. Okay, that's going back even a little and further. And yeah. that became a big, that became a big scandal. Uh -huh. And th he, was, he was arrested. He was put under uh, interrogation. Willy uh -huh. Brandt himself, the, uh -huh. the chancellor, yeah, right. went on the phone and he uh -huh. said, if you do not let Berg come back out, uh -huh. the detente between East and West will be finished. Wow. So yeah. the next day, yeah. Back was out, okay. and he was under the protection of the the, the, the the doves in the Kremlin, and he was under the protection of the West German mm -hmm. uh, politicians mm -hmm. who were trying to to bring to bring an end to the Cold War. And mm -hmm. he was the one, unlike anybody else, unlike the CIA, as you said, no. he was the one who predicted years and years ahead of the time. Yeah, this system will fail because it cannot survive because it's based on the wrong principles. Right, and that's this right. book, yeah. this book is making that point. That, but very good, and you've written a very good forward to it, and I appreciate that and everything. And that is, uh, it's undercutting. And the thing is that we're prog uh, like here, MNN, and mo pe people who care for the least among us. Mostly the people, I mean, because they're not been well served ever, and that we have a capability we're not realizing. And those are there are an awful lot of people who are enamored of what Karl Marx was saying. That is the problem is the private ownership of uh, the means of production, uh, and it gets in the hands of a few people, and then they become like serfs to those people who own it. And then what happens by doing away with the private sector, even, 
they did away, and so air, all po not all uh, uh, influence and power was in the government. No private sector. They wanted to privatize they, because that's an evil institution. We got to get over that. Absolutely. And so, is it possible to set up a system uh, where the uh, and then China does the same thing? They're just running dog through the American pattern. The American pattern is inappropriate. They still hold with the idea that the only way you can get any legitimate uh, income into the hands of the masses of the people. Not the, the the plutocratic leaders. That's like the Stalinists and so forth. Is for them to have a job, a labor relationship to production. We had to root that out. The way in which they should get income is to have ownership of a technological labor mix of production that is overwhelmingly productive, and they've got to have buying power in order to clear the market. The problem we have now is the people don't have money. To uh, meet the need to, to clear the market. So, in terms of a systems understanding, they have to have buying power in the hands of the people, and it shouldn't all be tied to jobs because the jobs are being undercut. You get an algorithm that can displace, in market terms, 100,000 people, and then you, you can't do it through labor distribution. The labor theory of value informs all political systems, ours included. And it includes Mr. Obama and the Republicans and everybody, the way it's set up and the institutions. We got to deal with those in some sort of a way that's relevant to what the future requires. Henry George, I would submit Henry Kelso and some others are relevant to that rather than going down the dead end of seeing doing away with private property in terms of a, a Marxian critique. And Mr. Berg led that. And uh, we still haven't come to it yet. I wanted to thank you. We are doing a commendable job in, in bringing out ideas and, and alternative thinking that is not been mainstream, and that's going to be the one thinking, the one kind of thinking that is going to rescue us from the nuclear holocaust and that's going to rescue us from the devastation it, of the planet where, that we are getting into. It right may now. be that big. It's hard to do because it's certainly not going to be understood by anybody because everybody who's in dire circumstances, how can I get a job? How can I serve on your estate? And the and the and the uh, re, you know the, we do not question that. That's holy writ. And we and George, Henry George says Henry George says we did away with ethnic slavery, but we have not done away with economic slavery we because economic our system slavery. is wrong. We Absolutely, have economic slavery. it is, and it's not working. They do it in China. They're going to be doing that, and it's coming that they're going to be. A, and the pro, the bigger question is that we have, and that's a bigger issue. You could be put out on you know the thing. Atomic weapons and bi back binary bacteriological weapons unleashed in hatred, like we've been doing, species lethal. Everybody goes, okay? It's on a, the side of that, equally it's significant on the side of the positive side of that is something that can't even be a said. We have transcended material scarcity for ourselves and the ecology. Henceforth, we need systems relating to that future that's dawning rather than reifying outdated institutions we've inherited out of a history. We do not need to blow ourselves up. We are, for the first time in the history of the world, capable of feeding ourselves, of providing for all the needs providing of everybody. Providing not only for the needs, but the wants and so forth. Yes, no baby has to starve. That's right. No baby and the ecology. And we have the means of doing that through good design. We don't have to we destroy nature. We need new institutions, no, and Henry no. George and Kelso and Fuller and all these other people are relevant to that. Thanks again for the book, for all the good work. Thank you for tuning in. We'll be coming back again tomorrow. That's it for this particular program. Kai, keep up all the good work. Great to talk to you always. Uh,